morning, everyone. Let us stand for our devotion. from Philippians chapter 1 verses 9 and 10 and it reads and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment and verse 10 states that we may approve things that are ex excellent that we may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. May the Lord have a blessing of the readers and the hearers of his holy scripture. You may be seated. Now we pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for who you are. You are a good God, and you are a great God, Heavenly Father, and you are in control. You blessed us with many things, love, grace, and mercy. And we gather here today just to say thank you and to praise you and to worship you in spirit and truth, Heavenly Father. We just thank you, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, we invite the Holy Spirit this morning just to be in our hearts, Heavenly Father, and take control of this service. Bless the one who's going to bring the word. The word is going to bless us with encouragement, enlightenment, and also to strengthen our faith, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, bless and lift up the members of this church the visitors and those watching online. Remember those who are sick, Heavenly Father. We need a healing. And Heavenly Father, remember those who are facing bereavement. Give them peace and comfort. Remember all of us. Continue to stand by us and be with us. We give you all the honor, all the glory, and all praises. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. How great is our God. Thank you, Deacon, so much for hey. the devotion. The reason we sing that is because we have to tell ourselves over and over, our God is great, that there's no problem 
that he cannot conquer. There's nothing the devil can throw at us. There's nothing that the world can do that he's not greater still. We get stressed out. We worry. We get frustrated because we don't understand how great our God is. So we have to remind ourselves that he's a great God, that he's a good God, but that he's bigger than anything out there. And if we really knew that, because I always tell, you know, brothers were so much bigger and taller than me, I didn't uh, when I was walking around, some bully came at me because I had some big brothers I could take care of them. And if you understood that about God, you got these, this big brother that can take care of any situation. And so you don't have to, you can just walk with confidence in this world. So we're going to thank God, our great God, for this service today and how he will move through us and speak to us. It's important that God speak to us. So we invoke his presence, although he's already here, we acknowledge as a congregation that this service, that it's his, it belongs to him. So, Father God, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you so much that you will speak to us today. So we're going to listen carefully for your word through scripture, through prayer, through song, through the preached word. We're going to listen to hear your voice because it's you, you have the words of life. Like Peter said, where can we go? You have the words of life. So we thank you so much for what you will accomplish today in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand one more time. We're going to read our um, psalm together. So let's begin. It's taken from the 127th and 128th psalm combined. Let's read together. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. When you eat the labor of your hands, you shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. Behold, thus shall the man be blessed who fears the Lord. The Lord bless you out of Zion, and may you see the good of Jerusalem all the days of your life. Yes, may you see your children's children. Peace be upon Israel. Amen. You have a seat. What the psalm is telling us, hey, Mom, I'm going to take your hand. You're going to come up and sing. Yes. So um, is that unless the Lord builds the house, testing. That's a blessing. You're having, you're having a birthday in, in four or five days. Yes, ma'am. Come around here. On June 29th, we'll be celebrating 101 years. So that's wonderful. Uh, and so saying it's a blessing to see their children's children's children. And, and um, I don't have any children, but I get to see her children's children. I hear the 
Man, so I've been teaching on 1 Samuel, uh, going through t- chapter by chapter. We know that last time David slew Goliath. Um, and so this teaching series is the path to anointing God's leader. That's what we're in the middle of doing. That's what the season we're in doing. So we're going to look to biblical examples of what makes a good leader, what makes a bad leader. Because we want to be those people who choose David and not Saul. Just in life in general. We want to know what are the qualities that make up, what does God look for. So we're going to review a little bit. Uh, in, for, in the 16th chapter, remember, it says, David came to Saul and stood before him. And he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. Then Saul sent to Jesse saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. So here's the question. Saul was going through a lot of stress. Uh, Why? Because he was messing up. And when you're messing up, your life gets stressful. So someone said, I know somebody. I know a musician. His name is David. He can come and play for you. So he knows who David is at this point. And he says to his father, Jesse, let him stay. He's great. And in fact... Not only will he be a musician, he's going to be an armor bearer. Okay, so uh, it says, says, so it was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul that David would take a harp and play with it with his hand. So uh, if, when we're reading about it, dis- the Bible says a distressing spirit from the Lord. And you say, why would God send a distressing spirit? Because it says whenever that spirit was on God, was a spirit from God was upon Saul that David would take a harp and play it with his hand. The Bible wants to make clear that this distressing spirit was from God. Why would God send a distressing spirit? And we're stuck with what the Bible says. So again, God creates light, and if I'm in a room and I turn on the light, there's light. Once I turn on the room, darkness replaces it. And so because Saul sinned, once he took his hand off, darkness replaced it. God is responsible for both. God says, I create light and darkness. We're supposed to live in the light. That's our choice. But if we choose to live in the darkness, the darkness is from God too. God does not want us to believe that the devil is his opposite equal, as though there's a football game going on. God lines up his people on one side, and the devil lines up his people on the other side, and they go at each other. The devil is not equal to God in any way. God controls the universe. So if darkness shows up, it's because you stepped into darkness. You've turned out the light. But both of them are from him. But he wants us to live in the light. So once the spirit of God moved, all that was left were distressing spirit. What happens when we're away from God is distress comes upon us. But that's from God too. 
He wants us to live in light. It's a very easy thing to live in the light. But if you choose to live in the dark, darkness will come on you. And he says, I created the darkness too. So if that's what you want, that's what you get. But that's not the devil. That's our choice. Too many times people are trying to rebuke the devil for something that they did. They put themselves in the dark. And you can't rebuke the dark. It's not going to leave. You need to just step back in the light. That's your choice. It's not the devil. And I, I knew somebody was <laughs> walking around with a rock in their shoe, not on purpose, but we're constantly, I rebuke you, devil. And they, all they need to do was take the rock out of their shoe. It wasn't the devil. And there's too many things we want to give the devil the credit for. So he says, was whenever the spirit from God was upon Saul, this distressing spirit, David would take a harp, play it with his hand, then Saul would become refreshed and well, and the distressing spirit would depart from him. Because God, David would be praising God, and, and, and he would get back in the presence of God. Here's next. It says, but occasionally, David occasionally went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So he made him his armor bearer, but Saul wouldn't use him the right way. Saul kept sending him home. Here, just go home with your father and take care of the sheep. So Goliath was there, as you recall. David had no idea that Goliath was there. Even though he was Saul's armor bearer, now there was finally a war going on. David was at home. Saul didn't even remember David existed. David shows up, kills Goliath, and Saul's like, who's this guy? Look at this scripture. It says, that, so Saul clothed David with his armor, put a bronze helmet on his head, clothed him with his coat of mail, like, okay, whoever you are, because he doesn't even remember who he is, you're going to go out and defeat Goliath. Okay, cool. So he sends him out. He defeats Goliath, and then he comes back. And in the next verse, it says, when Saul saw David going out against the Philistines, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, Whose son is this youth? And Abner says, as your soul lives, okay, I don't know. Now, he had hired David. He, he told him, talked to his father. He said, hey, I want him to stay with me. Send him back home. But he showed up. I don't even remember who you are because that's the kind of leader that Saul was. I only know you when I need you. Do you know those kind of leaders? When I don't need you, I don't even know what your name is. And so... He didn't need David, forgot who he was. David's back. Oh, I like this guy. Didn't remember that he'd already hired him. Okay, next. And Saul said to him, so whose son are you, young man? So David answered, I'm the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Bethlehemite. Remember you, you talked to him? You sent me home to go? Remember? No, nope, don't remember. Sorry, not paying attention to you because I didn't need you, so I forgot you. Out of sight, out of mind. Thank goodness that that's not how our Heavenly Father is. When we're out of sight, he, he's always thinking of us. That's why that scripture we were re reading earlier when we were reading that psalm says, why are you worried? All your labor, you know, uh, and you're getting up early and stressing out. He said, he's, he gives you rest. God's like, the, the Bible says, he that watches over Israel slumbers not nor sleeps. So I don't have to stay up all night. God's staying up all night, so I'm going to go to bed. Let God worry about it. God says, cast your cares on me. I'll care for you so that you don't have to. So he remembers us. But Saul, who's not a leader after God's own heart, doesn't even remember who David is, who his family is. So that's where we've left it so far. So now I think we start today's lesson in chapter 18. So I'm skipping ahead and giving you a preview it says, it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit from God came upon Saul and he prophesied inside the house. So something has happened to trigger Saul, so he's all stressed out again. Has anything ever triggered you so that you're getting stressed out? So it says, uh, the spirit came up and he prophesied inside the house. I just want to go over this prophesied. That word in the grammar in the Hebrew, could be um, translated ravings. So he was crazy and just saying crazy stuff. So when you're under the spirit of God, stuff's coming out of you, it's from God. When you're crazy and under your own spirit, then anything's coming out of your mouth and just mad raving. So Saul had everybody scared because he's just saying crazy stuff. He said, so David played music with his hand. 
Now, why does he mention with his hand? Because he says, as at other times, but there was a spear in Saul's hand. So he wants to contrast one person has a weapon of war in their hand. One person has a weapon of peace in their hand. Who are you? Because the, the, the world is divided up that way. There are people who show up and bring peace and calm situations down, and the people who come in and stir up stuff. And that you're either one or the other. Are you a peacemaker? Because the Bible said, blessed are the peacemakers. Are you a poop stirrer? Do you stir up the mess? Because you either saw with a spear in your hand. And people, you know them, they show up with a spear in their hand as soon as they walk in the room. So here's the problem. How do we deal with the people with the spears in their hand? Because you may have a boss, you may have a neighbor, you may have somebody over you who's just rough on you. Saul is ready to kill David. How are you going to deal with that person? And so today's sermon is we watch how Saul did it. It says, three spiritual laws to ensure you survive and thrive, or how to win by losing. How to win by losing, which doesn't make any sense. How, if I'm losing, I'm not winning. Well, weirdly enough, the Bible says you are. How do you defeat the guy who's got the spear in his hand? You've just got a harp in your horse. Uh, and, and God says you can win by losing. What scripture am I using for that? In Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, it says, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. What does that mean? Deny, don't forget who, what your name is? No. Let him deny himself, meaning deny your natural impulses. Somebody picks up a spear, my impulse is to pick up a spear, too. Oh, you got a spear? I got a spear, too. Now, <laughs> let's see right? And so that is our choice. He says, no, deny that natural instinct that you have to defend yourself, to go after somebody, to be aggressive. Whatever your natural instinct is, you got to deny it, the thing that you want to do, and take up your cross and follow me. What does it mean take up your cross? Jesus went to the cross for us, not for himself. And when he says, when you take up your cross, have a life that you're doing what God is wanting you to do, what God is anointing you to do for others as opposed to looking out for yourself. If you look after others, God will look after you. If you're looking after yourself, God says, okay, well, then I guess you got it. I won't worry about you. You're taking care of yourself. You, you, you know, fine. I'll go take care of those other people. So we have to decide which do you want. Do you want you to take care of you or God to take care of you? Because if you're like selfish and only think about yourself, God lets you do that. If you're thinking of others, then God says, I'll take care of you. To me, that's the better deal. He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So how to win by losing? How to win by losing. And that's what David did. He won this battle with Saul by losing. Okay, so now let's back up. So in, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 1, it says, Now when he had finished speaking to Saul, and if you recall in the previous verse, he simply said who he was. I'm David. I'm the son of Jesse. He's introducing himself like you would at an interview or any place else. Hi, remember me? No, I don't remember you. Okay, fine. But he says, when we had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. And Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Who is Jonathan? Saul's son. Saul is king, so that makes uh, Alexander. If Saul is king and his son is the what? The what? The prince. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so, um, and I know how you were in class every day. I was the same. I would answer questions for everybody. I had a third grade teacher who literally put a gag on my mouth and put me in the club, uh, and that didn't stop me. I still kept answering questions from the club. The, the, the answer's 32! Because I just had to answer. Something was wrong with me. Anyway, so... He's the prince. He's next in line. He's next in line. And yet he's seeing this person, 
And it says his, no, his soul was knit to him. His soul, even though he was the next in line, here's what he did in, in verse 4 of 18. It says, and Jan, Jonathan took off the robe that was on him, his royal robe, and he gave it to David with his armor, his sword, his bow, and his belt. Even though I'm next in line, God has touched my heart. I really know that you're next, and it's okay. I'm going to let go of, I'm going to lose my life for yours. I'm going to lose my position because I know that you're next. That's a hard thing to do. I had to do that one time. I was uh, on La Brea. This is 1988. I remember it specifically in June. It was the second week of June, 1988. I was on La Brea heading south, going to north, south, north north, going to Hollywood. I was at La Brea and Adams. And one of my students pulled up next to me who had just graduated. He was 17, 18. I'm 31. I was a young teacher, but still I had a life. I could sing, dance, act, write plays. I was ready to go. And God, I looked at this student who I only met maybe six months earlier. And God said to me, you're going to work for him. And I said, hmm? I scooby-dooed for just a minute. Hmm? <laughs> He's only 18. I'm 31. He, what, who, what is he? Now, his name was Tim Story. Um, he just graduated. He went on to become a director in Hollywood. And uh, he just had a movie that just came out, as a matter of fact. We, movies coming out all the time. Uh, God said, you're going to work for him. And that was depressing for a second because I thought he surely you meant work with him nope <sighs> and God dropped something in my heart for him and from that moment on I wanted to help whatever he had to do and and we worked to, we've to, up to this day that was 88 this is 23 what is that 40 35 years I've been working for him and Jonathan must have felt that way like Wait, I'm the prince. He's just a shepherd. What do you mean? I, you want me to give him my robe? and get, You mean you want me to let go? And sometimes God wants us to do that. Let go. So what did David do? David Did David immediately go up and say, hey, everybody, I'm going to be the new king. The prince just gave me his robe. What did he do? Because he certainly could have. Remember me, I just slew Goliath? Well, this is further proof. Why didn't he? So I think this spiritual principle is what's next. The law of number one, I told you there's three principles. Don't attack your enemy's reputation to build yourself up. He could have gone after Saul and said, I'm the one who slew Goliath. Saul just was sitting on his behind watching Gilligan's Island reruns. I was out there in the field. I did this. I did that. And he could have made everybody feel bad about Saul. I've seen people do that. When they wanted a promotion, when they wanted a job, when they wanted something, I've seen them tear somebody else down in order for them to get it. If you do that, God will eventually tear you down. It's a spiritual principle that even if your enemy is coming after you, because you'll never see David attacking Saul. You'll always see him protecting him. As much as Saul came after David, I don't have to drag you down. God sees you. God sees that person who is attacking you. God sees that person who's coming after you. He will take care of them if you just keep still. You know that verse says, I'll fight your battles if you keep still. That's the condition. If you move, I'm not going to fight your battle. If you try to fight the battle, then I'll let you. If you drag that man down to get ahead, then I'll drag you down. But if you just don't defend yourself, do not attack your enemy's reputation to build yourself up. What scriptures support this? Okay, let's look at them. In James, he says, he gives more grace. He gives us grace to do these sort of things. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. That person who walks around and builds himself up, God resists that person. But those person who says, I don't have to push my way to the front, I don't have to announce myself. And this is counterintuitive to how the world teaches. The world says, go in there and tell everybody how good you are. 
go up and say, hey, I can do this and I can do that and I can sing and I'm incredible and rather than go in and let everybody know your credentials, the Bible says do the opposite. Do the opposite. It's counterintuitive to how we're taught. How will they know unless I tell them? You might have to trust God to tell them. If God puts that in somebody's heart, it's permanent. If you put it in their heart, it's there until the next person comes along. You know the people who just last for a little bit, those one-hit wonders, and then they're replaced, you don't even remember them anymore? When God does it, it's permanent. There are careers that last for years, and there are careers that are just a flash in the pan. Let God build the house. Then it lasts. Here's another scripture. It says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Humble yourself under his, humble, put yourself in God's hand. Okay, God, he will exalt you when it's time, and it's hard to have patience. It's hard to have patience because we want to get ahead now. We think if we don't get ahead now, it's gonna, we're going to miss that opportunity. It's going to be gone. But when God exalts you and sets you up, nobody can, no man can knock you down. When you set yourself up, you will get knocked down. So humble yourself under his hand. Like, God, I'll just stay and I'll wait for you. It's another scripture. A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. Your gift, what, what, if you can sing, if that's your gift, people will notice if you can uh, garden, I'm just making stuff up. If you, whatever it is that you can do, whatever your gift is, God will make sure people know that it's there. You don't have to announce it. You don't have to trumpet it. People will see you doing your gift. They'll turn to you and say, hey, can you do something? Well, actually, yeah, I can. Fantastic. But you don't have to push your way in. It's the opposite of what the world teaches. That's what we have to decide, how to win by losing. So here's how David did that. So David went out wherever Saul sent him, because Saul sent him out in the army, and he behaved wisely. He didn't tear down Saul. That's what that means when he behaved wisely. He didn't say, ooh, well, here's another battle that I won, and, you know, Saul's just sitting at home. I'm just saying, here I am out here doing a great job, and Saul's just sitting there. He went out and won a battle and gave all the credit to Saul. Saul sent him over the men of war, and he was accepted in the sight of all the people and also the sight of Saul's servants. Here's what happened next. Now, what had happened as they were coming home, when David was returning from the slaughter of the Philistines, that the women had come out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing to meet King Saul with tambourines, with joy, and with musical instruments. Here's what they said. So the women sang as they danced and said, Saul is slain his thousand and David is ten thousands. I don't know if that's how it went. Saul is slain his thousand and David is ten thousands. So they gave credit to Saul, but they saw what was happening because your gift makes room for you. People see what's going on. You, we don't think they see, but they see. So here's how Saul reacted. Then Saul was very angry, saying this pleased him. And he said, they have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me, they have ascribed only thousands. Now, what more can he have but the kingdom? He's got, so this makes him paranoid. You can tell you're in the wrong position when you are upset by somebody else's success. Well, I didn't get enough credit. And I, I'm always surprised when I run into that, when people are really mad because they didn't get the credit they deserve. And then I think, but haven't you read the Bible? Saul got really mad about that, and it messed him up. And I guess they don't read the Bible. I mean, people in the church, because I'm so shocked when they do things the opposite of the Bible. And I think, I guess you don't believe the Bible, because you would not do that if you'd read it. Because Saul's all upset. I only, they only I, he gave 10,000, I gave 1,000. Who cares? God will exalt you if you need to be exalted. And so he's scared of David. Next. So Saul eyed David from that day forward. Okay, he's my enemy now because they like him more than me. And there are people who are that way. Saul's trying to win. He's going to end up losing. 
David's losing his life. I'm not saying he behaved. I didn't, Saul didn't say, hey, look what they said. He didn't put up a billboard on sunset. I've slain 10,000. He didn't say anything because your gift makes room for you. So here's what happened next. So it happened on the next day that the distressing spirit came up on Saul. Now, this is where we started out. He, he prophesied inside the house, which means he was just going crazy. So David played music with his hand as at other times. But there was a spear in Saul's hand. So that's where we started. Who are you? The peacemaker, which is okay to be the peacemaker. Or are you the, the troublemaker? Okay. So here's what Saul did next. Here's the next law. I'm saying don't adopt your enemy's tactics. Don't, don't, just because they did it, you don't have to do it. Well, he cussed, I'm a cuss. Well, he yelled, I'm a yelled. Well, she threw a spear, I'm a throw a spear. Don't, don't adopt your enemy's tactics. What scriptures back that up? Okay, let's see. It says, repay no one evil for evil. This is Romans chapter 12. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. It's not possible to live peaceably with everybody because some people are just crazy. But as much as it's possible, live peaceably with all men, right? If you can't, don't you start nothing. But some people are just always going to be starting something. You can just have to back away from There will be no peace, but don't, don't let it be because of you. You don't have to always fight back. Next. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So again, that's your choice. Do you get them back, or do you wait for God to do it? I think that God's going to do it in a better, more spectacular way than you could come up with. Moses could have gone in and slapped Pharaoh. How dare you? Or he can wait for God to drown the entire army in the Red Sea. That's bigger. Moses couldn't have drowned the army in the Red Sea. So if you want your enemy taken care of, just let God take care of it. He just says, I really will do it. He watches everything. That's why we don't have to get stressed out when it looks like somebody's getting away with something. It all comes out in the light eventually. Next scripture says, therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. What? If your enemy is hungry, I should go, ha, 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 you're hungry. No, no, feed him. I want you the opposite. If he's got a spear, play music. If he is thirsty, give him drink, for in doing so you will heap coals of fire on his head. Let's discuss this scripture. So if you're nice to somebody, is God saying you're punishing him? Like, why would you be heaping coals of fire on his head? Some of you know that um, in their homes in Israel, they had like a little brazier, a little frying pan kind of where they would have coals and that's what heated their home. They didn't have an electric oven or stove or a microwave. You literally had coals that you would set on fire, and sometimes the coals would go out. So you had to go out at night or in the middle of the day whenever they ran out. Now, what you didn't do was carry the coals like this because then the sparks and ash and smoke were going to come up in your face. So you carried it on your head. <coughs> and people, as you walked by, who were on their roofs, pour coal down on their heads to fill up their thing so that they could survive, so they can live. When you are feeding your enemy, you're giving that thing that helps him survive, it helps him live. Because he thinks he needs your downfall in order to survive. He thinks he needs you to trip up and, in order for you to live, but that's not what he needs or she needs. They need love. There's a reason they're attacking you. There's some deficit in their life. There's a reason that they're coming after you. So love them. It's hard to do. Smile at them. But they were just dirty to me. They just said this to me. They just said, love them because you're going to give them the essentials in order to survive. It's their choice of what to do with that coal. They may take it and throw it at somebody, but you're giving them what they need. So feed your enemy. Love your enemy. So let's see. I think there's one more scripture. Oh, no. So let's see how David. So it says, Saul cast the spear, for he said, I will pin David to the wall. This is not a warning. This is not, I'm going to scare him. This is, I'm going to pin him to the wall. This spear is going through his chest. I'm going to try to kill David. 
So David, everybody sees this. This is in front of everybody. Uh, but David escaped his presence twice. Okay, those of you who like to answer questions, the spear was thrown at David and it missed. How did Saul get the spear back? Who gave it to him? David, come on. See, you. if I was asking Alexander, you'd answer. Okay, so da what's wrong with David? I mean, the spear came at David. David duck here and gave it back, and he threw it again. That's feeding your enemy. That's loving your enemy. That's crazy. That's winning, though, by losing. Because I'm not, because he could have thrown it. Hey, I'm going to give you your spear, all right. Here's your spear. Uh-uh. Hand it back to him. He just threw it again. Because I, I love, twice. Escaped twice. That man tried to kill me. David went back. Um, bringing in the sheaves. Just started playing again, you know. And they, so I'll throw it out again. Here's your spear. I'm going to tip out this time, though. So uh, here's the next verse. So now Saul was afraid of David. Because the Lord was with him, but had departed from Saul. He tried his hardest to hit him, and he missed. That scared him. And David just smiled and gave him back his spear. That messes up somebody. That messes them up. Aren't you scared of me? No. Because the Lord is my shepherd. Not you. Loved ya. And you just go on. And that upsets somebody who loves to win by intimidation. They want you to be scared of them. But if you just smile and act like nothing's wrong, they don't know what to do. That made Saul afraid of David. Like, well, I'm scared of him. He must know something. Yeah, I do know something. I know Jesus. That's who I know. And I know he's on my side. And I know as long as I'm doing what he wants me to do, I'm going to win. I'm not going to respond the way the world wants me to respond. Okay, next. So Saul removed him from his presence and made him captain over a thousand I can't take the person smiling at me, singing all the time. Get him out of here. And he went out and came in before the people. And David just did his thing. Didn't, still didn't talk bad about Saul. Could have. Could have. Let me talk about this crazy person tried to kill me twice. Hello, 911. Let me file a report. Yeah, crazy man up in my house. He be throwing spears. Nope. Just went and did his thing. Next verse. So David behaved wisely in all his ways, never said a bad thing, and the Lord was with him. Therefore, when Saul saw that he behaved very wisely, he was afraid of him still. He, David is winning the war by doing nothing. I'm not going to badmouth Saul. I'm not going to talk about him. I'm just going to do my thing, and I'm winning. He's losing because he's trying to win. I'm trying to lose my life. I'm trying to let go of my natural instinct to fight back. I'm trying to net... Go with my natural instinct to cuss somebody out. I'm losing my life, but somehow I keep winning. Next. So now, Michael, I, this is really Michelle, but Michelle, like we say Michelle and Michael, right? Saul's daughter loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. David's like, this is going to be how I get him, right? Next. So Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him because he knew Michal, and she's going to make David crazy. So I'm going to win. She's going to be a snare to him. She's going to get him so upset, he's going to do something stupid. He's going to say, oh, I can't take it anymore. I, uh, because, and so this is perfect. And she'll be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines will also be against him. Why would the hands of the Philistines be against him because of that? Well, okay. Because he's had to give a dowry. In those days, you had to give a dowry because if you were taking someone's daughter away, you're taking away all the things that that person does. They cook for the family or sow or plow fields or paint houses, whatever it is they did, they were going to lose that. So you had to pay them money. Here, let me have your daughter. Well, that's, that'll be about 5000 10000 Well, for the king's daughter, you can imagine how much it would cost, and there was no way that they would be able to pay it. Saul had already offered his older daughter, Merib, and David said, I'm good. So he'd married away to somebody else. But Michal... She's attractive. She'll get him. So the Philistines will be against him. Therefore, Saul said to David a second time, because he'd already offered the other daughter, you shall be my son-in-law today. He said, well, okay, let's see how it went. The story went from there. So the law of third law, final law, exceed your enemy's expectation and demands. Exceed them. 
exceed them. I'm going to ask something of David. And when he tries to do it, that's going to mess him up. The law says do even more than your enemies demanding of you. How, how do we know that? Let's look at some. In Matthew, it says, you've heard that it was says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. In the old days, you black my eye, I black yours. You knock out my tooth, I knock out your tooth. That makes fair, right? That just makes sense. Whatever you do to me, I do back to you. Jesus says, that's not how we operate anymore. He says, do it this way. I tell you not to resist an evil person. Don't resist them. Somebody says, ah, pick that up for me. Go, okay. Go d- do this. All right. Drive me down to the, okay. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. This is a metaphor. If you are in a marriage and somebody is slapping you in the right cheek, then not even one. This is a metaphor. If somebody's beating on you, this is not, he's, he's saying metaphorically, if somebody's doing something to see how you're going to react, clearly they're going through something. So instead of slapping them back, just, hey, go again. And that will freak them out. Pick that up. Okay. Want to pick up something else for you? What's wrong? That, I was trying to make you upset. You can't make me upset because the joy of the Lord is my strength. So I'm good. Uh, next scripture, Jesus says, if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. Ah, give me that coat. Okay. And you want my sweater? That throws people off because you're supposed to say, no, well, you give me your coat. Give me that shoe. Well, you give me your shoe. And then that just makes you, that's returning evil for evil. Here's the next one. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. What does this mean? So the Roman soldiers during that time could go up to any Jewish citizen because the Roman soldiers were there protecting Jerusalem. We're protecting you. So since I'm here protecting you, this backpack that I'm carrying, it's too heavy for me. You have to carry it for me for a mile. It was a law. If I come up to you and say, you got to carry it, you got to carry it for a mile. So normally they would go, okay, mile through, and they would kind of, as soon as they got to the mile, okay, I'm done, there. Do that thing where you, you're about to hand it to them and you just drop it, ha ha. Jesus says, they ask you to go one mile, say, okay, I'll go even one more. That will throw them off, exceed their expectations. Someone's demanding something of you in order to intimidate you, okay, I'll do that and more. It's counterintuitive because you want to fight back. You don't have to. I'll fight you. If I see you doing this, I will go in and fight your battle. If I see you fighting your battle, then I'll sit back and just see best man wins. Okay. But if you resist fighting, I'll fight the battle for you. So let's see how this might have played out with David. This is the final one. Then Saul said, thus you shall say to David, the king does not desire any dowry, but 100 foreskins of the Philistines to take vengeance on the king's enemies. He gave them a good reason. Now, not just kill somebody, but prove you killed them by bringing back their foreskin, and that's proof. Because people don't let you take their foreskin. They're, they must have been dead. Not only will it prove that you killed that person, it's going to get all the Philistines mad at you because you've desecrated the, their dead bodies. So he wants everybody mad at David. Don't just kill him, bring back the lock of hair, bring back a hundred foreskins. Uh, so Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When they see this man, because you got to then take time to cut off the foreskin. You can't just kill and run. You got to now perform surgery. They're going to see David cutting off foreskins. They're going to take care of him. So David said, what the, are you crazy? Get off, get back off. Nope. Next. So when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to become the king's son-in-law. Now, the days had not expired. Like, he gave him a time limit, and David went ahead and did it. So they, David's like, okay, I can do that. Next. Therefore, David arose and went, and he and his men killed 200. Man asked you to go one mile, go with him two. He asked for 100 foreskins, give him 200. David's following a spiritual law. Do more than they expect. They're doing that to trip you up. Do more. Uh, Drive me to the store. Okay. Want me to drive you somewhere else? 
kill them with kindness. When I read the scripture where David was playing the, the, the lute, I was going to call this sermon, Killing Him Softly with His Song. Uh, but kill him with kindness. So he killed 200 men of the Philistines. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full count to the king. And here's a one, and a two, and a three. And he counted them out for David. Just counted out those foreskins. That must have been just something I don't want to see. There are things when I get to heaven I want to see. Ooh, Lord, show me the, roll the tape of the, the flood. Uh, show me when the this Red Sea parted. I want to see that. I don't want to see them count out the foreskins. I'm good. So, uh, that he might become the king's son-in-law. Like, okay. Then Saul gave him Michal, his daughter, as a wife, thinking it was going to mess him up. So David's been acquiescing over and over to Saul, giving over to Saul, letting Saul throw spears at him, send them off to war, make him do all this stuff. Let's see who won. Next scripture. So thus saw Saul and knew that the Lord was with David and that Michal, Saul's daughter, now loved him, and Saul was still more afraid of David, so Saul became David's enemy continually. Like, I, what am I going to do with this guy? So Saul's trying to win. He keeps losing. Here's the last verse in the chapter. It says, then the princes of the Philistines went out to war. And so it was, whenever they went out, that David behaved more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name became highly esteemed. So David won in the end. People loved David. What did he do? Nothing. He didn't fight back. He didn't challenge. He behaved wisely. He was always smiling, joyful, never talked badly about the king. The king tried to kill him, didn't say anything. God promoted him because he humbled himself. God says, I will exalt you. These are three spiritual principles about not fighting back, not promoting yourself, and not adopting their tactics. Just love Love conquers all. We have to believe that. We need to become a church where people go, oh, my goodness, there's so much love in that church, as opposed to, oh, my goodness, there's so much disagreement in that church. He, want, he says they'll know we're Christians by our love. And when people want to walk among us, know that Christ is here, it's because we're doing something supernatural that the Bible asks us to do that man cannot do. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and for your graciousness and your mercy. And we thank you that you fight our battles if we keep still, that you said vengeance is yours. So help us not to fight back and to live peaceably with all men as much as possible. Help us use David and Jesus as our examples of people who respect one another, love one another, and allow you to take the vengeance, allow you to fight the battles. We're just going to love and love and love our neighbors and even love our enemies as you ask us to do. And as we do this, you exalt us, you esteem us, you give us higher positions so we can be a greater influence. So help us to be a church full of love because that's when we know we have the victory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if there is anyone who doesn't know the Lord, I don't think so. I'm looking around, and most of you got saved before I was saved. So, uh, but if there's anyone who's watching on Facebook or on YouTube, you just happened to cross this accidentally, if you don't know that love, if you don't know the love of Christ, it's such a simple thing to ask him into your life. And I invite you to make Jesus your Savior and your Lord simply by saying, Jesus, come into my life. Please be my Savior be my Lord, and I give you my heart. And it's just done. I repent of my sins, Lord, and I thank you for your forgiveness. He then begins to walk with you. We want to think that it's a hard thing, but I've, surely I've got to pray seven times and bow and, and wear white all day. No. He says, I just stand at the door and knock. Just open up. I'll come in, and God will do the rest. If you've prayed that prayer, we'd love to know. If you've prayed, if you're watching, then please call our, this, our line, that's, which is 323-232-0956. Or if you have any kind of prayer request, if you have any kind of prayer request, we'd love to pray with you. So call and leave a message, and we'll pray because we, we have a praying church. Now here's some announcements we want to give before we go. Uh, if you want to give an offering, 
If you're here in the service today or if you're at home and you want to give an offering, you go to our Facebook page, um, our website, which is Good Shepherd, Good Shepherd, sometimes we forget the H, Good Shepherd, MBCLA, Missionary Baptist Church, MBCLA.com. There's a green button that you push. You can use PayPal if you want. You can do that today if you'd like when we collect the offering. Um, also, uh, here's an announcement. Sadness and celebration simultaneously. It says, the family of Ralph Douglas Lucky Sutton is so blessed and thankful for all the prayers and warm thoughts sent our way. The viewing will be held on Thursday, July 6th, 2023, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Angeles Funeral Home on 3875 South Crenshaw Boulevard in Los Angeles. And the homegoing service will be held Friday, July 7th. Friday, July 7th, here at Good Shepherd at 10 a.m. on the corner of 510 West 53rd Street in Los Angeles. If you want to send any cards to the church, the zip code is 90037. So we know that we all want to be here to support the family. The interment will follow at Inglewood Park Cemetery, 720 East Florence Avenue in Inglewood, 90301. And a repast will follow in the Good Shepherd Fellowship Hall after the service, after the interment at the funeral. So we invite all of you who can to be here to support the family with your love and with your prayers. Also, the Good Shepherd has become accepting applications for pastor. If you tell anyone out there that you know that is thinking about being pastor, uh, the time period is from June 1st to August 1st. They need to go to our website, goodshepherdmbcla.com, because all the instructions are there. Follow the application instructions. And there's three ways you can apply. You can fill out the application directly on the website. You print the application. It's the second way is to print it and email it, the completed application, uh, to Hunt for Pastor with the, four, the, the number four. Hunt for Pastor at GoodShepherdNBCLA.com. Or you can print the application and mail in a hard copy to the church. Uh, make it out to the Pastor Search Committee, Care of Good Shepherd Baptist Church, 510 West 53rd Street, Los Angeles, California, 90037. So uh, those are three ways for it to be done. If you let anybody know, we have the time period between June 1st and August 1st. Um, and I think we have one more announcement. Yes. So social media outreach ministry. We would like to thank the two volunteers who came forward last Sunday. <laughs> thank you, volunteers. So, and just we'll talk again real quick after church. Um, if, if, you, if anyone else is interested, please contact me uh, after the service, if you know any young person. Uh, but uh, we're going to get started soon. They, they're on all the social media. They know what they're doing. Yay, because I don't know what they're talking about. Okay. I, and again, so Wednesday Night Bible Study is online. It's on my Facebook page at 7, but it's on the Good Shepherd NBCL of NBCLA Facebook page at 8. It's also on our YouTube at the church website, goodshepherdnbcla.com. It's on all those places. Our website, on Facebook, it's on YouTube. Uh, also, uh, Sunday School, the same thing at 10 o'clock, all those places. You can check the, the church YouTube website Facebook page. So if there's anything further, I'd like to thank those people at home for watching. Amen. And we invite you to watch with us next week.